This is the ultimate iron reaper, I like to refer to it as. And I'll, I'll share it with you in a moment. But this actually involves a uh, casting from the 1950s circa Oliver tractor front axle. We'll move on. And Oliver had a brainstorm, a lot of other manufacturers did too, that in this case, uh, if you wanted something really strong, make it bigger. But the problem in this case is they're making it bigger, but it's a non-ductile gray iron, which does what? It does not flex, right? So if it doesn't flex, what's going to happen if it's stressed? At 40 to 50,000 tensile, it's going to break. This axle actually had tubes that went in from each end. The steering knuckles dropped down below that. So the force, the uh, knuckles were actually held in. This was a row tractor with adjustable knuckles. You could slide those tubes in and out. And there were U-bolts that went through from the top side, you'll see that, that held the tube of the knuckle that came down here and down here and actually held that in place. And the stress would be on the U-bolt position where it's strapped around the tube. This is just another example of how poor the casting of what We know it's a casting because it's full of blemishes like this. As the molds get older, you get this kind of casting flaw, issues like that. It's not the best uh, iron material. It certainly uh, was a poor casting. This was the replacement, the solution they came up with after they discarded that massive iron axle. They were able to replace it with this. This held up in service. The iron axle did not. So it tells you something about technology and, and metallurgy, different types of metal. This is nothing more than, uh, you know, this is a steel tubular system, and it has ductility, so it will move and flex, and it doesn't break in service. This is an uh, in-the-day repairer on that axle, the cast iron piece. This is bronze. This is actually a brazing technique. And I will comment in fairness to the person who I'm sure is long expired. Uh, this was done professionally. And uh, as gross as it looks, it was done to enable putting this tractor back into service in the field with this axle. This is how thick this was. To give you an indication of how thick thick is, this flange area is about an inch and a quarter. And the thickness of the wall was about three quarters of an inch. Whoever did this repair in the first place ground this V. This is not me grinding this. They ground this V all the way to the root of the crack and filled the entire thing up with bracing rod. Braced it, successive bracing layers until they built it up. Now we want to make this cosmetically right. And we want to make this as stronger, stronger than original. So uh, time not being of any concern to us, I go to work with the grinder and start grinding all the brass out of this. And I literally ground several pounds of brass out of the break. OK, in cast iron, when you have a crack, whether it's a, a Willie's block or whatever, when you go to make a repair, you have to drill a hole at the end of the crack. If you do not do that, after you make your weld repair, that crack will continue. So in this case, there's a hole drilled here and here at the end of the crack. And if you look, I've actually ground down to the original root. The crack went all the way to the bottom. It's an open gap in this area. You can see a remnant of the crack right here. This is actually the original crack, a hairline right there. But it cracked all the way through from the outside of the house into the root, the base of that. This is how much metal I had to grind out because I had to remove all of the, the brass. Brass is not a fusion process. It was brazing. I'm going to TIG weld this, so this has to be spotlessly clean. And I have to make sure this is cast iron only. At this point, you're looking at this and saying, oh my gosh, what has he done to this axle? You have a huge gap here. This is a 330 seconds electrode. To give you a sense of scale, those of you who are familiar with TIG equipment, this is how deep that weld is. This is the root pass in the weld. The crack is right down here in the base. This will be the first pass through there. This is how wide the material is that I have to weld. And I'll make successive beads from the root pass all the way up and fill this entire gap. The beauty of uh, using TIG is that it does not have a wide heat affected zone, so it's not spreading heat all over. Again, with the weld mold material, and this is absolutely blasphemy. Anybody in the cast iron business will tell you, you would have had to stick this entire axle in a blast furnace and bring it up to temperature and weld it inside the furnace. I did this on my bench, and this is thanks to weld mold. I made the first pass with a preheat to only 500 degrees with a rosebud torch and a settling rosebud. After that, I did not use the rosebud at all, and that's the 750 rod that they say you can often weld without any preheat at all on cast iron. So I start making beads, and this is TIG. I use a TIG filler rod again, the 700 and 750. I start in the root, 
back and forth. You'll want to drive the graphite through the weld, and in order to do that, while it's molten hot, you're hitting it with a ball peen hammer to diffuse that carbon and graphite and make sure this remains ductile. Remember, we want this weld area to be ductile so it doesn't crack or pull in along the heat affected zone. I'm getting somewhere. Again, the weld mold is uh, 75,000 tensile. The gray iron, the original iron, 40,000 to 50 if, on a good day, and the uh, sporosis casting was probably 40. And this is now 75,000 PSI in the weld area. And this was the weakest point of these axles. And you can see that I'm building successive beads. You can run stringer or weave beads with this material. I have a creative way of approaching this. I don't want them running all in the same direction, so I'm making curvature uh, beads, if you will. This is the same piece, that huge V. I'm getting closer. Of course, it's brought at the top. It's a day after day thing. Literally, it took me three days to do this. This is getting closer to the finish passes. The beauty of TIG welding is you get no undercut on the edges of the weld. That bead stops here. There's no undercutting. And every pass, you notice there's no undercutting. So you get deep penetration. You get a narrow heat affected zone with TIG. So the heat isn't diffusing out the sides excessively. And the beauty of it is, if you overlap it properly, it'll penetrate deeply, and you end up with a quality piece of metal that's like the original, or better in this case, obviously. Okay. This, again, is a buildup. I want to make it stronger, and I'm going to make it cosmetic. So I actually created beads that went beyond the curvature of the original. Okay. Now, cool down. Cool down is critical with cast iron. You cannot cool it down in the air. As soon as I finished my day's welding, literally day, my four or five hours under the hood, I would wrap it up in the heat blanket. This is a heat blanket, not asbestos, because we don't do asbestos anymore. Let it cool down. It took nine hours for that axle to cool down each time. OK, I want it better than original. Where did it break? It broke where the U-bolts attached. This is one of the U-bolt holes here. The other one is up in this area. Just inboard of where the knuckle tubes went in was the weak point. Of course, it broke. There was a step here, an actual step. Where is it going to break? It's going to break right at the step. So this is mild steel strap. The weld mold 750 will actually weld cast iron and mild steel together. So you can see that I've tack welded this. Okay? And this is with TIG. And this is cast iron to mild steel with the 750. Welding rod. There's a piece that I put in here for reinforcement. There's your bolt hole. Here's the other bolt hole for the U-bolt. And I've made a small mild steel plate up in here, and that's welded in place, too. Back to the TIG again. There's your process. It's just a lot of patience and pass after pass. Now, you can see what I've done here. This was the original crack all the way through and beat out and all that. I've done the same thing in this area. I'm building this up now. You can see the groove, the remnant of the groove. And there's the ball for every single pass. I want to drive that graphite into the metal. Use a stainless steel wire brush. TIG has to be spotless. Any contaminants at all, and you'll get uh, inclusions, you'll have problems. This has to be in a clean environment. Again, now I just do the use a simple grinder, air grinder, and I make sure that it's level between where the tube will go through the original casting and no high spots in here. The welds are penetrating. There's plenty of penetration. It's a very strong piece. Okay, now I've got this built up. You remember it was originally done in brass, and I start hitting it with nothing more than a surface grinder. I'm trying to illustrate that you don't need, you know, major tools. You can get by with what's considered uh, somewhat fundamental tools. And I start working that material. Cast iron is not that difficult to grind off. And I start shaping. And you've got to be a sculptor, but and patient. You work your way through this. Uh, you want to get a finish on it? Just a simple quarter inch hand drill, 3 8 hand drill, a uh, drum sander, and I'm finishing off. I want the cast iron to look identical in all the areas, including where the repair has been made. This is just about roughed in completely. This is that lip. This was a, a gap, a huge gap before, ground out in a V. I built that entirely up, and I've tried to make it look as, and you can see I was successful, as much like the adjacent metal, so it looked just like the crude casting that Oliver made in 1950. Getting almost close to done. Okay, this is that two-part uh, epoxy primer, Omni AU, comes from PPG. 
It's uh, catalyzed and mixed with a reducer. It's that broken area with the first coats of paint, or in this case the primer, and block sanded just lightly. Same broken area that was originally bronze. Okay. This is the finished piece. This is what it looks like with that epoxy primer in place. This is the interior. These are the parts that can't be seen that are reinforced now. I took a reamer and reamed out the holes so they're concentric and they match the original U-bolt holes. And that's the piece. It's done. You go back into service and this repair section right here is now 75,000 tensile instead of 40 to 50. And it's uh, fusion welded in a way that is crack resistant. There won't be a cracking problem and it should do the trick. Now we have to applaud to wake up those who call us. I'm up for discussion. That was the second part of this. I'm done presenting, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions you might have.